and that. Then we go there. Ben, are we cool? Can you see my big screen? Yes. Okay, let's get yes. started. We're on page one of the new lecture outline. Qualitative analysis. And this is what we might call old school chemistry. The word qualitative is telling us that there are no numbers involved. This is just qualities. These are descriptions. And if you had taken this class in, say, 1930, you would have had a chapter on oxygen. And then you would have had a chapter on sulfur and things like that. And we're not going to have a chapter on oxygen, but we're going to have a day where we look at a few specific chemicals that are very popular with the AP exam. They're used in a lot of labs and some very classic ways of testing for certain chemicals that pop up in our labs and keep coming back over and over again as questions on the AP test. Now, the AP does this to force teachers into doing labs. Now, of course, this year might be different, but I'm really not gonna treat this year any differently than any other year. I'm going to cover this material, okay? Because these questions will still be on Chem Olympiad. Okay, so for each of these species that are on the first page of this lecture outline, you should know their chemical formula. You should know their general appearance, basic uses, and the typical labs that we use them in for AP Chem, or just the typical labs we use them in. I mean, this doesn't really have to be specific to AP Chem. Uh, probably important to know that I am not going to teach to the test. I'm just going to try to teach a good college chemistry class. I will make references to specific things about the exam, but I'm just trying to teach a good college class this year. So we're going to start off with potassium permanganate. Now that's KMNO4. <clears throat> this is often called the purple juice. It is really dark in even low concentrations. So you have to get it super dilute for it to go down into pink colors. Now, the manganese in this is a plus seven oxidation state, which means it is incredibly good as an oxidizer to the point where you can use this stuff to start fires and cause explosions and all that fun stuff, okay? We have some really good demos we do some years at the Faraday Lecture with that. <clears throat> we use it in the redox titration lab. Now, AP Bio also has a redox titration lab which is the dissolved oxygen lab. And for years and years, when Mr. Larson was teaching AP Bio, he would hit that lab and the kids would have AP Bio periods one and two. Then they'd walk into honors chem periods three and four and their hands would be stained with potassium permanganate. And it looks like, well, it looks like a bad henna. Okay, like somebody that didn't know what they were doing or that they spilled the henna ink. And immediately I'd say, oh, you're doing dissolved oxygen this week. And what would happen is the kids would like clamp on to me and I'd have to spend a class period explaining to them how to do the calculations for the dissolved oxygen lab. Okay. Oh, well, I just realized something. I never put on the blazer today. Better make this right. This is cool, though. <laughs> There we go, now it's official. Okay, now potassium chromate. I'm not supposed to show you this in school, except to be a photos. This is nasty. This is a carcinogen and a mutagen, okay? K2CRO4. Now, let's be honest, this looks like a bottle of urine, 
okay? And it is a, a, it's an incredibly distinct yellow color. Let's just accept that, okay? It is a really good redox agent, but more than anything, it is a source of chromium metal, which we can use to make complex ions, transition metal compounds. And if you were coming to Chemex last year, and Chemex will start again next week on Friday, uh, but if you were coming to Chemex, we did an entire unit about transition metal compounds. We, this is one of the things that we use as a source. Now, we used it specifically in some equilibrium labs. Uh, however, it is so nasty that we ended up replacing it with iron thiocyanate. And that, that's going to be kind of infamous for you guys specifically, because the iron thiocyanate lab was the very last lab you did before we had to shut down last year. Okay. Potassium dichromate, even worse than the chromate. We are not supposed to have this at all. K2Cr207. Now, I'm thinking about 20 years ago, the year 2000, maybe the year 2001, a film was released starring Julia Roberts called Aaron Brockovich. It was all about dichromate. Uh, and it, she got an Oscar. She won the Academy Award for Best Actress for that movie. And it just highlighted really well how nasty this stuff is. It is orange. It is distinctly orange in solution. Wow, it just pops. It's so easy to identify. Now, in addition to everything I said for chromate, it's, this is good for, you know, Equilibrium labs, it's good as a source of chromium, et cetera, et cetera. This is also an outstanding catalyst for organic reactions, and it's used in a lot of different ones because it's such a good redox agent. So my first exposure to this stuff came in eighth grade science because very commonly it was used in uh, volcano demonstrations. And I even did them the first two years I was teaching at San Fernando High. Uh, but I, I just, I have no intention of going near this stuff anymore. It's nasty. Ben, how's my timing? Am I going too fast? No, you're going all right. Cool. It's your job, your monitor today. I'll have my wife make you a nice little pink satin sash that says lecture monitor. <laughs> <laughs> cobalt chloride, it's really technically cobalt two chloride. It's the two plus cobalt. I love the look of that compound. I call it Bravo Burgundy. It's a joke, okay? COCl2. It's really a reddish pink when you put it into solution. You might remember Last year, <clears throat> I brought both the uh, honors classes together and did a review lecture for kinetics. And we did a visible activated complex demonstration. And you saw this as a catalyst before, and you saw this after, it turned green in the middle, okay? But we call this Bravo Burgundy. It's good for making complex ions amongst a lot of other things. It's good in some equilibrium labs, but very specifically, AP chemistry does spectroscopy labs based on this compound. Now, it is, it, the bottle carries a warning that if you are asthmatic or have other similar breathing issues, that this dust is something you want to stay away from. Uh, I've never had a student complain about it, but I've had a couple kids who said, when they saw the bottle, I've got issues. And I said, okay, we'll have your lab partner do that step instead. Uh, but I've never had a kid have a reaction to it. Okay, now, 
the iron thiocyanate complex ion you actually created in honors chemistry last year. You take some Fe3 plus ion, which would be yellow, react with some thiocyanate, which is clear, and form FeSCN2 plus, which is, some people call it blood red, some people call it brick red. You did this, it was the very last lab you did, and then you made it darker and you made it lighter by adding other things to it. Now, this is used in several different AP labs for equilibrium and spectroscopy. We're gonna use it in a few this year also. The really cool thing about it is it's easy to control the concentration and then it's relatively easy to measure the concentration with visible light spectroscopy. And a friend of mine, a guy named Tom Kunselman, who teaches in Michigan, he's at Community College in Michigan, he has just released the specs, the parameters for how to turn your cell phone into a visible light spectrophotometer for at-home labs. So we're likely gonna be doing some of those this year. Okay, now, I'm, I'm feeling bad about this lecture for one reason. If we were in the classroom, I would have all of these bottles out on the table and I'd be passing them around the room. And you'd be opening them, looking in them, I'd be making the solutions, holding them up to a light so you can see the colors and everything I'm talking about. But this compound specifically, iron three chloride, this is just a unique, it's a unique looking compound. It looks like something my cat coughed up, okay? When we go back to this slide and I say that the Fe3 plus is yellow, it's not translucent. It's thick, it's ugly. Often, rather than making it up in water, we mix it in nitric acid. It turns out the Fe3 plus precipitates with anything that's basic, hydroxide ion, carbonate ion, even sulfate ion, oxalate ion, things like that. So if you put it in the nitric acid, uh, those things aren't able to precipitate with it. And these big chunks that this stuff exists in, I've had some kids say that it looks like Mexican rock candy, okay? And it's not smooth and shiny. It has this powdery appearance. Uh, if we have any Filipinos in here, it's kind of the consistency of povlerone, okay? It's that powdery stuff on the surface, uh, but it doesn't have the uh, nice cylindrical shape. It, it's, it's very uneven all over it. So it's yellow, it's, it's murky, it's funky. We use iron three to make complex ions and we use it in a lot of redox reactions. We convert iron three to iron two or we convert it back to iron zero, okay? And it's just a great compound because it's hard to work with. And you learn a lot about its chemistry because of that. I'm very grateful to whatever book it is, I don't even remember anymore, 30 years ago, that I read to dissolve it in nitric acid rather than in water. It just really helped my lab prep skills. Okay, now here, here you go. <laughs> this is one of the most ubiquitous lab chemicals you can imagine. Ubiquitous means it's everywhere. Silver nitrate. Technically, the name is silver one nitrate. Now, this stuff is the only soluble salt of silver. Silver fluoride is sparingly soluble, but silver nitrate is the only completely soluble salt. Now, it is a clear colorless solution, but it's a white powder. Now, you, your first thought is, you know, why am I not showing a picture of the white powder like any of the other things? I want you to take note of the bottle. This is an amber bottle. We always use that term, amber, it's brown, but we say it's amber. B12 
because this stuff is photosensitive. It's like hydrogen peroxide. When you buy hydrogen peroxide at the drugstore, it comes in a brown, opaque bottle. Not like rubbing alcohol, which is just, you know, a clear translucent bottle. So if I were passing around the bottle of silver nitrate, you would open it and you'd look in and you'd say, Mr. Morgan, you're lying to me. This actually doesn't look like a white powder. It looks kind of gray. And you're right, because what has happened is you opened the bottle. And when you opened it, you let light in. And it doesn't have to be UV, visible light does it. It converts the silver one ion to silver metal. So we're actually producing that precious metal inside the bottle. Now, this 50 gram bottle of silver nitrate probably costs $125, okay? So I usually like keep track of the bottle as it works its way around the room because this stuff's expensive, okay? But it is amazingly, oh, what's the term I wanna use here? Useful <laughs> in the lab because silver precipitates with everything. So you can use it to test for the presence of lots of different ions, okay? And one of the things we were about to do in ChemX when we had to shut down was a four week lab of separation of ions, which kids just absolutely love doing. And we use the silver nitrate in about half of the lab. Now, I was not involved in this and I'm not just making may sound better, <laughs> it's actually the truth, but there was a guy on my floor, my freshman year of college, who had some of this, which he nicked from the freshman labs. And one night, about 2 a.m., he put some on some of the doorknobs in the hallway. And there was this young lady who I will never forget, an amazing individual named Stephanie, who, woke up and had to pee. And she opened her door, came out in the hallway, closed the door, and the silver nitrate got on her hand because she grabbed the doorknob. And like a lot of people, when they're tired walking down the hallway, she went ah, and rubbed her eyes. And she spent the next week with this black streak down her face, and on the palm of her hand. Because when the silver nitrate hits the hand, the AG plus converts to AG metal. And it's not polished silver, it's raw unpolished, so it looks more black than it actually looks that silver shiny color. And ooh, there was an uproar, because this they got on the hands of four or five different people, and it would, everybody figured out really fast who it was and yelled at the guy. He didn't like getting yelled at. So a week later, he did it again. Except this time, he didn't do it to the doorknobs. He went into the bathroom and he put it on the toilet seats. And we ended up with a whole bunch of people that had these black rings on the bum. <laughs> and it, it wears off when you exfoliate, okay? But uh, it, it takes a week or so to lose that skin, okay? So silver nitrate's a great substance, okay? Now, sodium chloride. Sodium chloride's just all over in your life. And this is not, you know, a pitcher of table salt, obviously. This is halite. This is the big raw form that you find in nature. And this chunk is big, I mean, like that big, bigger than my head. Uh, one of my very close chemistry teacher friends, Larry Walker, who was out at Calabasas High School, he just retired last year, talk about good timing. He uh, also had a degree in geology and he had thousands upon thousands of pounds of rocks. And when we were teaching together on the weekends at UCLA, he would always bring in these different rocks. And he's got a chunk of halite uh, that's about the size of a large toolbox. Uh, and I'm hoping he passes that on to me someday for use in some lectures, but it's sodium chloride. Now, 
It's a white solid powder, it makes a clear solution, it's kind of hard to identify by sight because it looks like lots of other things. But something I want to warn you about, when you go into the kitchen after this lecture, look at the bottle of sodium chloride. It's probably actually a paper cylinder uh, that's in the cupboard. There's a pretty good chance it's not pure sodium chloride. Most of the time, it's a mixture of sodium chloride and potassium iodide and iodine. See, we call it iodized table salt. Before the early 1970s, I can't tell you exactly what year, there was a terrible problem in this country, if not worldwide, with a disorder called goiter, G-O-I-T-E-R. You can look it up. Goiter is a thyroid issue caused by a deficiency of iodine. And it will cause the buildup of a very large mass in the neck. And it can become the size, uh, really, of like a grapefruit. Now, it, it's not painful, and it's not deadly or anything. But it, it's definitely not pretty to look at. And it's just because you're not getting enough iodine in your diet. Now, I have not seen a case of goiter in America since I was like three or four, five years old. I have seen it, though, uh, when I've been in the Philippines and in some third world countries where iodine is not as prevalent. Uh, now, I never saw much of it when I was a little kid because I grew up here in California on the coast. Goiter was not a coastal problem because people on the coasts, when they eat fish, it's seafood. And seafood is rich in iodine. But if you're in the Midwest, the fish that you eat predominantly comes from lakes and rivers. And that's freshwater. And those fish don't have, or they're not really uh, a good source of iodine. So this was a Midwest problem. But as soon as they started putting iodine in the salt, and let's face it, Americans, we use too much salt. Okay, this problem disappeared almost overnight. Just boom, it's gone. Okay? All right. Ammonium chloride looks exactly like sodium chloride. Very hard to tell the difference. However, if we were in the classroom, oh, you would know, because it easily decomposes into ammonia, which is smelly. Now, it's the middle of August, it's hot, and I've got about four or five bottles of this in the stockroom. So I let each period open a bottle that hasn't been opened since like last spring, and all that ammonia is built up in it. And man, you get a whiff of that smell. And it's, there'll be people who are coughing because it's like a smelling salt. It's really strong. Okay. Now, ammonium chloride is a very good chemical because the ammonium is really soluble. So we can use it as a, a, just an amazing source of soluble chloride. Okay. Now, oh, probably my favorite of the day, copper two sulfate. It's a hydrate. Now, I don't like the way this image, which I just got off the net, types it up. I would not put the five after the water. I'd put the five in front of the H2O. But copper sulfate is a brilliant blue color, okay? Yeah, we use it in a hydrate lab. We, we use it in a lot of labs, probably six or seven labs throughout the year. Okay. Now, we often refer to it as being something called tidy bowl blue. Now, that might sound a little strange, so just be patient with me here for a second. What I'm going to do is take you back to my youth. And that is not what I want here. I want to close that out. I want to close that out and go right here, and let's watch a commercial that was very popular when I was watching reruns of The Three Stooges and Hogan Heroes when I was a kid. I'm fed up with scrubbing. Excuse me, but you need Tidy Bowl. Here. Oh, it's you, the Tidy Bowl man. Will this help? Sure. With each flush, Tidy Bowl releases strong cleaners to help keep toilet bowls staying free. How do I know Tidy Bowl's cleaning? 
The sparkling color tells you that it's working hard. Tidy Volt's powerful and safe on plumbing. That's great. Comes in lemon fresh blue or pine scented green. With Tidy Bowl, you'll scrub less. Safe on plumbing, too. Okay. All right. So that means if you're in somebody's house and they've got blue toilet water, it's got copper sulfate in it. Okay, so that should be the end of the first page. I don't know, we got any questions about page one or are we good? No questions so far. Okay, all right, we'll start to move on to page two unless something comes up. Okay, Lugol's solution. Now this is a fancy name. Most science teachers don't even know this solution by this name. They just call it iodine. It's a mixture of I2 and Ki. And this is a very simple test for the presence of starches. Yeah. Uh, Daniel asked, what lab is AgNO3 used for? It's used in probably 20 different labs. Anything involving precipitates. Any okay, precipitation lab. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anytime. Okay, so let's talk just ironically here. Uh, these classic qualitative tests are not something that you would do in a laboratory situation today if you were, you know, professional forensic chemist because you have technology that will do it for you. However, if you were in the field, you would use all of these because you can't take your big machinery with you out into the field. So these tests, even though they are 100, 150 years old, are still very viable today. And I remember as probably a fourth grader, yeah, it was Mr. Schultz's class, so it had to be fourth or fifth grade, him dripping iodine onto a potato that he'd cut open. And we saw that it turned blue, and that meant that the potato contained starch. And I think we also watched him drip it onto some pasta or rice or other things along those lines, okay? So, Lugol's solution is just a fancy name. It's iodine. You probably used it in your biology class for some osmosis labs, things along those lines. It's very simple. All you do is drop it in. You don't have to do anything else. It works on contact. It's a test for starch. Now, Benedict's reagent or Benedict's solution, whatever you wanna call it, is very complicated to mix up. The most important thing in it is that it's got copper to it. It's, put it this way, it's so complicated, I don't mix it, I buy it by the liter from Flynn, <laughs> okay? I just, it's easier just to buy it pre-made. So when it comes in the bottle, it's that nice brilliant blue that you see on the left. Now, it's a test for technically what are called reducing sugars, except that means monosaccharides, simple sugars, not polysaccharides, not sucrose, but things like glucose or dextrose or fructose. Now, it has to be heated. So when it heats, it forms Cu2O. And that's from it being reduced from a copper two to a copper one. Okay, that's not gonna be a test question, don't worry. But the intensity of the color will tell you how much of the sugar is there. So what we typically say is, if you see it turn red, you know you have a positive test for the presence of reducing sugars. Not trace amounts, but yes, that's got monosaccharide present. Now, when I was a young kid, five years old, six years old, they used to sell tablets of this stuff at the pharmacy and you put it into a styrofoam cup and you pee into the cup. And if it turned red, that meant you were diabetic. 
that meant that there was an excess of glucose in your bloodstream, which made it into your urine. That noise you hear is just the cat behind me complaining that she's hungry. <laughs> uh, so no fancy glucose meters at that point in time, okay? Now we're to a point where you don't even have to stick your finger anymore. Glucose monitoring can be done via Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, okay? But this was one of the uh, original tests, okay, for presence of monosaccharides. Okay, phenothaline you're familiar with. It's an acid-base indicator. There are many, many acid-base indicators. Now, the reason that it's a popular one and that I'm mentioning it because we use it so much in high school labs is twofold. One, clear and acid, pink and base. Nice, easy to see. But the second reason that it's so prevalent is that phenothaline used to be sold as an over-the-counter drug called Exlax, which was a laxative, makes you poop. And that went off the market in 1997. So chemistry teachers who didn't want to spend a fortune to the chemical supply house for acid-base indicators could just buy this over-the-counter drug, grind it up in a mortar and pestle, and throw in some alcohol, and all of the phenothaline would uh, dissolve in the alcohol layer, and boom, there's your acid-base indicator, nice and cheap. Okay, I don't think I actually put this one on the lecture outline, sorry, but as I was making up these slides, I thought this would be a good one to throw in. Biuret solution is a test for protein. And it's actually a very complicated solution to prepare. Also, it's got things like sodium hydroxide and copper sulfate and potassium sodium tartrate, okay? When it is untested, it's kind of blue, and in the presence of protein, it turns a lavender or a purple. Now, don't get confused. This is not the word buret. This is biuret. This is our test for protein. Okay, so now let's move on to a very different type of test, solubility. We know from uh, drawing Lewis structures that we have compounds that are polar and compounds that are nonpolar. And we have said as kind of a general thing, like dissolves like. So polar compounds dissolve in water because it's polar. And nonpolar compounds dissolve well in oil or pure alcohol because they're nonpolar. Now, when I say alcohol, I'm not talking about liquor. Liquor is predominantly water with some alcohol in it. Laboratory alcohol is 100% alcohol. And typically it's poisoned. The technical term is it's denatured so that you don't drink it. Okay, uh, so why would I put a bottle of salad dressing here? Well, you see it's layering, don't you? This salad dressing has a mixture of oil and vinegar, and the oil is nonpolar, and the vinegar portion is polar. So they separate. Now, I can mix them. I can shake it up really good, okay, and form an emulsion, okay? Uh, actually, technically, it's probably a coli. <laughs> but when I sit the bottle down, the two types, the polar and the nonpolar portions, will start to separate. The one that's less dense, happens to be the oil, is going to go to the top, and the one that's more dense is going to go to the bottom, okay? So if I have a compound and I'm not sure whether it's polar or nonpolar, I can try to dissolve it in water. I can try to dissolve it in pure alcohol. 
and a C. Now, on the AP exam, this is actually becoming a very big deal to understand this, but it's the why and the how, not just the that it happens. And we'll get back to that in our chapter on liquids and solids. Okay, now, I have a table here about solubility rules. And solubility rules are something that we did last year. We did net ionic equations. We're going to review them next week. But I just want to point out a simple thing with this table. And I'll let you copy it down. Precipitates often have different colors. So sometimes we can use precipitation to identify compounds based upon whether they precipitate as a white solid or as a black or as yellow okay and precipitates just will at times produce okay different appearances which are very uh specific to the compound i'll just give you a second on this table I have a very needy cat here. If any of you speak Tagalog, my cat is Malikot. Want to say hi, students? Want to say hi? Nope, not today. Ben, are we good or you need a second? Like 15 more seconds? Sure, no worries. Okay, so we're gonna move on now. Now we're gonna look at gases, okay? And this is, again, one of those points where I'm really disappointed because this is a lot of fun to actually do in the room and to remind you of something that we had done last year. So if everyone could just put their pencils down for a second, I'm gonna get out of this. I'm gonna go over here. We're gonna get rid of this old commercial. Okay, and we're gonna look at some demos I would have done in the classroom. Now, typically, I think you know I don't trust YouTube, but I wanna point something out. Scott Malam. Scott is a friend of mine who, he actually has, he teaches in Michigan like Tom Consumin does. And uh, Scott is good. I have a lot of faith in his videos. So if you are searching for uh, an alternate viewpoint, looking on YouTube, uh, Scott's a good person to be looking at, okay? And he is a dad of three and trying, you know, single income dad supporting a family. So he's trying to monetize this. So you're gonna get commercials. And 
I, I don't fault him for that because he's trying to raise a family, okay? Uh, but you're not going to find commercials on my YouTube stuff. <laughs> so just, just be patient with him for that, okay? But I, I, I think his stuff is decent and he doesn't teach you the wrong stuff. So he's one of the few people who I would actually say you can trust on YouTube. Generation G. This is how to do basic flame testing in the lab. If you're ever producing bubbles and you want to know what the gas is, there are three very common gases. And these are the three different things that happen when you add a flame splint to that. So we can see there a lot of bubbling going on. We're going to take a flaming splint, put it into the flask. And when we do that, we notice that the flame extinguishes very, very quickly. So this first gas here is carbon dioxide. And when we put a flaming splint into a container with carbon dioxide, the splint extinguishes. Okay. And the second one here. Just a little bit of that. A little bit of potassium iodide. And the second one, we're going to be making oxygen gas. So when we take a flame splint and put it out, it will reignite in the presence of so much oxygen. If we put just the splint in there, we get a very brilliant flame. All right, and then the last one, we're going to generate hydrogen gas. We're going to have a little bit of calcium water there. It's going to take just a second to get that coating kind of off of the calcium so we can really get the hydrogen gas to be produced. We're going to help that with a little bit of shaking here. So you can see that bubbling. That bubbling is hydrogen gas, and that's going to build up in the container. So do the test for hydrogen, just like the other ones, take the flaming splint, put it into the container. Not ready yet. I'm give it a quick little yelp. I'll build up a little more, we'll try it again. There we go. So and then of course, Carbon dioxide is still over here. Oh. Okay, we're going to go and look at one more here, which should come up next. It didn't. Let me check my bookmarks. There we go. Experiment of detecting carbon dioxide gas using clear lime water. Calcium hydroxide, which is known as clear lime water, is used to detect the presence of carbon dioxide gas produced from the reaction of sodium carbonate or sodium bicarbonate salts. With diluted hydrochloric acid,
by passing the gas through clear lime water. What do you observe? Clear lime water. So you see right away what's happening over there. You're getting a very murky looking result because you're getting a precipitate of calcium carbonate. So let's go back here now and see if we can get all of this into a nice table. Nitrogen. Nitrogen is the tricky one because nitrogen has no color, no smell. It's a suffocant, just like carbon dioxide, and there really is no special test to detect it. So we have to use uh, more advanced means to actually figure out if we have nitrogen gas is our sample. Now, oxygen is the only gas that will relight a glowing splint. So that's a very easy gas to detect. Now, I'd like you to add a little note here, okay? I want you to go onto Wikipedia and look up Apollo 1, the Apollo 1 spacecraft. Or call it the Apollo 1 fire. Hydrogen. A lot of you probably got some good video with your phones last year doing this lab in my classroom. And if any of you have some really awesome footage of it, send it to me and maybe we'll put it up on my YouTube channel. Carbon dioxide. I would have done the demonstration a little bit differently. I probably would have had Ben standing in front of the room. His hand held straight out with something on fire and I would have hit him with a carbon dioxide fire extinguisher. Now, ammonia which none of those focused on. Ammonia is clear, but it has a distinct smell. So you can identify it from that smell immediately. Now, there's no point in doing a splint test. In fact, why do you want to put flame into ammonia? It would make it smell even worse, okay? Now, nitrogen dioxide, you remember from your first day of chemistry last year, and that's the Ira Remsen demo. And in fact, uh, the Ira Remsen demo is going to go and become available for you today uh, on the AP Chem uh, playlist on YouTube, okay? I've got a version of it in there for you uh, to look at. So I'll leave this up here for just a minute, let you get caught up. That smell of nitrogen dioxide is so distinct, smog. And in LA, we don't get bad smog anymore. And I'm not talking about, you know, fires and all that smoke that's up in the air. I'm talking about real NO2 smog. Now, any of you who have been in places like Mexico City or Mumbai or Manila or Beijing or Moscow, you know what I'm talking about. It's an unmistakable smell. I remember being at uh, junior high, Walter Reed Junior High, now Walter Reed Middle School, back in the late 70s through, uh, through 1981. And one day, at least every other week, we were allowed to skip PE because the smog was so bad. We would have smog alerts. And there was, there was you know, a, a smog alert, one, you know, first degree, second, and it, it's second degree, no PE. At first degree, if you had asthma, you could skip PE. Ben, are we good to move on? Yes, I think so. All right. Now, this, I'm just going to put this up for reference. Oh, sorry. Sorry. This is going to be your lab this weekend, which I'm hoping you actually do this afternoon. Normally, I wouldn't actually even talk about this. Uh, I would just have you go and do it and fill in the lecture outline based upon the experiment itself.
Okay. Stop share.